And I would invite you to take your Bibles and go with me to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. We will look together at the first five verses of this passage. I remember years ago reading a story uh, that was recorded by a soldier in a military conflict who was on the run. He was alone, by himself, separated from his uh, group, his squadron. He was alone and on the run and was being uh, chased by a company of soldiers. And at one point in time, he sought refuge in a shallow cave. And he told the story that as he was sort of hunkered down as low as he could get in this shallow cave, he began to notice a spider begin to build a web over the mouth of the cave, over the entrance of the cave. And he sat and just watched the spider begin to weave this web. And a few hours later, uh, the company of soldiers that were looking for him, they came past that cave and presumably went right on past and didn't search it out because they saw the spider's web. Presumably, they noticed the web and noticed that their target could not have been in there. Otherwise, that web would have been disturbed. And so for him, it was a web of security. A web of security. As we've worked through this letter called 1 John, we've seen the Apostle John weave a web of sorts of security for the people of God. A web of security that shields us from the fears and insecurities that seek to hunt us down and rob us of the incredible joy of knowing where we stand with God. The opportunity that we have that God wants us to experience, to know that we are His, that we are secure, that we have an eternal relationship with Him. What a great God we serve, amen? That He wants us to know. He wants us to be assured that we have eternal life, that we are indeed in right standing with Him. As John moves towards the completion of this letter, he brings together several points of this web, if you will, this web of security. And I like the language of web or the image of a web because it communicates an interconnected sense. And that's exactly how John communicates about these things in 1 John 5, 1 to 5. That these sort of birthmarks of authentic faith, of true faith, are not isolated. They're not just itemized. Rather, they are very much interconnected. They're very much tethered together. Okay, you don't have one without the other. And so John gives to us again this web, if you will, of security. This web of security for us in Christ. Notice uh, these things and how interconnected they are as we look at this text. These aspects, these headings of truth, love, and obedience. Or right doctrine, right relationships, and right living. Or for our purposes this morning, for sake of outline, true belief, true love, and true life. Now check out your text, 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. John says here, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. True belief. True Christians, John wants us to know, embrace right doctrine concerning Christ. Now this birthmark of authentic faith, in fact, builds kind of bookends of this text. If you look with me at the first part of verse 1 and then the last part of verse 5, everyone, he says, who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Last phrase of verse 5, who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes? Notice with me the repetition of belief here. The one who believes, who trusts that Jesus is the Son of God. So John is talking about belief, but primarily about the object of that belief. Who is Jesus Christ? So John is saying it's crucial that we understand who he was. It's crucial that we understand who he is. As we've stated a number of times before in this uh, series, in John's day, uh, Christology or the doctrine about Jesus Christ was under attack in a variety of ways. It was under attack. 
Uh, those that had gone out from them, these false teachers, chapter 2, that had gone out to reveal that they were not actually of, they denied that Jesus of Nazareth was actually the Messiah, or that Jesus of Nazareth was actually the divine, the divine Son of God. They denied his deity. They denied the reality that you and I believe, Lord willing, here this morning, that God came, that God put on flesh, and that Jesus Christ, as the divine Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, went to the cross, and there, in an actual body, he laid his life down as an actual sacrifice for sin. He actually died. God actually died for us. So the false teachers in John's day denied this. But John here again affirms it. Notice what he's doing here in 1 John 5, 1. Everyone who believes what? That Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, is the Christ. He is the Christ. He is, verse 5, the Son of God. And so, my friends, as John defends this and continues to affirm it in a number of ways, understand again that the doctrine of Christ is not up for grabs. Okay? One of the predominant heresies about Jesus down to the ages and even still today is this notion that Jesus is kind of a myth. Right? And perhaps some wouldn't even use the language of myth, but that's how they would talk about it. Because here's how it comes out. It's basically this. Jesus is this for me, and perhaps he's that for you. And that's okay. We just kind of look at the story, the myth, as it were, of Jesus of Nazareth. He was a pretty special person. And you just kind of pick and choose. You, you, you take what you want from the story. This is how it impacts me, or this is how it impacts you, and how it changes my thinking about life, or thinking about death, or whatever. And it's kind of a free-for-all. John says, it's not a free-for-all. My friends, to think that way, to not have precision with regard to who Jesus was, who Jesus is in his person and work, is not only dangerous, it's damning. My friends, this is serious, that we think accurately with regard to who Jesus is, so we can't apologize for precision. We must be precise with regard to who Jesus is. More on that next week. But let me just pause here and ask the question. Do you know who Jesus is? My friends, do you know who Jesus is? What do you understand and believe about who Jesus was and is? And then, furthermore, is he your only hope? I hope and pray that you can say that he is. Understanding who he is, that he is indeed your only hope. So, Number one, true belief. Number two, true love. Look at your text. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. True Christians, my friends, embrace the Father and all his kids. Grab this. True Christians embrace the Father and all of his kids. You see that here? And notice with me again how John weaves this together. It's very much interconnected. Everyone who loves the Father, what is that in reference to? The fact that they've been born of God. First phrase. And everyone who loves the Father, John assumes that those who are born of God are going to now love their Father. They're now his children. And those who love the Father also love who? Love other Christians. We love the brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay, so it's not surprising that we're talking about love. We've talked a lot about love in this series uh, through 1 John. We talked about it even uh, last week. But here I think it's cool because John adds a, a little different twist to the picture. A little different twist. So... Previously in our studies in 1 John, what we found is that John anchors his commands for us to love one another in the character of God. And you can follow his logic like this. John says that God is love, 1 John chapter 4. God is love, and therefore those that are in him, those that are connected in God or born of him, 
have inherited that DNA. We've inherited the love from God. Therefore, he says, we ought to then give it out. Like if we've received this from God, if we've inherited that DNA trait, we ought to then give this love out. Okay, that's how he's talked about it. But here I think he adds a, a bit of a twist to it. Here I think John anchors his expectation of our love for one another, his command for us to love one another in our love for the Father. See it in the text. Don't just take my word for it. See it in the text. What does he say? And everyone who, verse 1, loves the Father. Now he's talking about our love for the Father in context of what? In context of our being born again. So what is John saying? I think what John is saying is that our love for one another, his command for us to love our brothers and sisters is anchored also in our mutual experience of God's love. So let's tease that out for a moment. The argument goes like this, that you and I as individuals have been so filled, so filled with the love of God, so amazed, mesmerized by the love of God, that we are able to then come horizontally and go, and you've experienced that too, right? You've experienced the same thing as me. We understand this, right? In culture, we understand this. This is why uh, reunions are a thing, right? That's why some people have family reunions. They come together to do what? To celebrate the mutual experience of being a part of a particular family or maybe a particular culture. You also see this on TV sometimes, like they'll do reunion shows, right? Famous shows, the cast comes back together, Friends, Seinfeld, Andy Griffith, right? They come back together and they, they talk about, you know, what it was like to film and their, their, their connectedness together. What was, like, what, what was it like to be a part of that cultural moment or whatever? Or perhaps you've seen uh, championship teams come back together. Maybe it's like 30 years later, and all of these what once were like prime professional athletes, they're kind of old and you know, maybe not as in good of a shape or whatever, but they're sitting around and they're talking just like it was yesterday, right? Remembering the plays, remembering all the things that led up to their championship trophy. We understand that. They're talking about it and there's a fraternity there. There's a camaraderie there that's pretty special. Could I ask you a question? Is there anything more special Think with me. Is there anything more special than what God's people have to reunion together about? Think with me. Is there anything more special than that? Is there anything more significant than the opportunity that you and I have to gather around the gospel? Think of it in terms of the songwriter who said, I once was lost in darkest night and thought I knew the way. The sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will. And if you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still. But as I ran my hell-bound race, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state and you led me to the cross where I beheld God's love displayed. You suffered in my place. You bore the wrath reserved for me. Now all I know is grace. Hallelujah. All I have is Christ. Hallelujah. He is my life. Now what John is saying is this. You and I can come together and say it this way. Hallelujah all we have is Christ. Hallelujah. He is our life. John believes this mutual experience of God's love should help us love each other. You guys grabbing this? Should help us love each other. I think this does. If we take this seriously, it helps us to love each other. When we get our eyes off of the relatively minor things that we may not like about each other or disagree with with one another or even minor offenses between one another in a community of faith, we get our eyes off of those things and onto Christ. We recognize, man, like I, 
I've been forgiven. I don't deserve God's love, but I've been forgiven. I'm secure in God. Like, I know where I'm going if I die. I don't have to live in guilt or shame or anything. I've been set free. And so have they. Helps us love each other. It helps us throw our arms around each other. True love. It's a mark of authentic faith. True Christians embrace the Father and all his kids. Number three. True life. All this points ultimately to a life that is different. A life that is authentic underneath the authority of the word of God. True Christians. John would say, joyfully embrace God's word as the path of light, as the path for living. Now, again, as we notice verse 2, again, look at your text, verse 2. Notice how interconnected this is. John is weaving this together. It's an all or nothing thing for him. By this, we know that we love the children of God. What, what is he referring to? He's just sort of writing in a circle. What he's just talked about our love for one another. Now, how can we know that we love the children of God, the brothers and sisters? When we love God and obey his commandments, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. True Christians joyfully embrace God's word as the path of light. True Christians have had a heart change with regard to the word of God, with regard to the authority of the word of God for life and practice. And so let me ask you a question. Really, I'm going to ask one question in two ways. Why do God's children obey? Why do God's children want to come underneath the authority of the word of God? And secondly, why are the commands of God not a burden? They're no longer burdensome, as you can see in this text. You know what the answer is? It's one word. My friends, the answer is love. <coughs> the answer is love. Not just because I say so. See it in the text. Check out your text, verses 2 and 3. Notice with me how John emphasizes love here. He says, when we love God vertically, when we love God and obey his commandments, our love for God is going to lead to obedience. Moreover, he continues, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and they are not burdensome. Notice with me the phrase. Let's just dive into this for a moment. This is the love of God. What is he saying here? A couple of options. First, I, I would offer, this is what love for God looks like, that we would keep his commandments, or I think better, this is the effect of God's love on us. The effect of being introduced to the love of God has the effect of changing our perspective on the word of God. Right? So what has changed the picture? What has changed the picture is love in terms of a relationship now that we have with God. Man, there's a thousand ways we could illustrate this, but you guys know that love makes the change. Love makes the difference. It changes how we feel about life. It changes how we behave about life, how we interact with life, right? So a husband who loves his wife, it's not a burden to get her flowers on her birthday. Why? Love. Love. I'm not worried about cost. I'm not worried about effort. Why? Love. Love has the capacity, my friends, to turn burdens into blessings. Isn't that true? Love has the power to turn the have to into the want to. Because it changes us from the inside out. One commentator put it this way, what you desire with your whole heart is not burdensome to do. Uh, I had the opportunity to preach in a 
a school this week uh, out in Central City. It's a high school and it's an elementary school, and I was laughing with the elementary kids about my kids and their relationship with sleep, that sometimes there's a struggle for their mom and dad. For example, every night when it's time for bed, and we're like, put your PJs on, brush your teeth, it's time for bed. No, no, we're not tired. I'll just lay awake all night, Dad. Like, I can stay up. Please, let me stay up. I'm not tired. Then, like 6.30 the next morning, it's time to get up. Everybody get up. No, Dad. Oh, it's cold. I want to sleep. I'm so tired. What changes things, though? What changes things? Sometimes I can talk to my little one, Zoe, in the morning, and she's like, no, I don't want to get up. And I'm like, a chocolate chip pancake just came off the griddle. <laughs> Ready to go, right? Because that's her love language right there. Chocolate <laughs> is her love language. So we know how desire impacts, right? How desire impacts our hearing of a command. Get up. Right? Changes everything. Certainly this is what clicked over for the psalmist, David. And he writes phrases like, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Or, for example, Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. How can someone say this about law? How can someone say this about commands that sometimes, if we're honest, feel a little bit inconvenient? Love! Because now he's reading the law or reading the word of God underneath and understanding that these are instruction, instructions from a loving father. Okay, They're, They are not laws from a sovereign killjoy, but instructions of a loving father. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple, so good for my life. The precepts of the Lord are right, Rejoicing the heart, the desires. He's talking heart level. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them, by these instructions from a loving father is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. What's made the change? Love. Love. It's love, my friends, that's displayed in the cross, displayed in the forgiveness that God offers us in Christ that turn the commandments from a standard that we're just trying to keep in order to try to appease God or earn merit with into a love letter whereby he's saying, you're secure in Christ, but I want you to live a certain way to bring glory to my name and for the joy of your life. You will never regret it. My friends, you will never regret living your life underneath this book, ever. It's the path of true joy. So question, has God rearranged your desires in that way? So that now you're looking at this book and going, I want to know. I want to know what God has to say. If I have a question, in fact, about something, maybe my conscience is being pricked about something, I... I want to, to know, like, what does God have to say about this? Because above all else, I want to follow him. I know who he is. He's a good father. This is the true life. But John has a little bit more to say here. As he's brought together these points of the web, this web of security, of belief, trust in accuracy with regard to Jesus, love for one another, and a rearranged heart with regard to the word of God, a desire to live underneath his authority. He's brought these together. He now says this in verse 4. Check it out. He says, for, okay, don't just skip over that word. 
this tethers what he's about to say to everything he's said before. As we consider this web of security, he says, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? You might say, what is he saying here? What does this have to do with everything we've talked about? You see how John sort of brings it full circle? Back to simple belief, back to simple faith and trust in Christ alone. This is how, this is how the world is overcome. But let's pause. Because we have to ask the question, what does he mean by this? Like, what does he mean by the phrase, overcome the world? What about the world needs to be overcome for you and I? Well, in order to answer that question, we would need to go back to chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, to understand that when John says the world in this context of it being overcome, he's not talking about people. He certainly doesn't tell us to hate people or overcome people. He's talking about the world's system, philosophies and ideologies that stand in opposition to God, that stand in opposition to his word. He itemizes how they affect us in 1 John 2, 15 through 17 in these three ways. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The desires or the natural uh, lusts or cravings for sin, for things that are contrary to the word of God that we, by the way, all have. We all have. We all have natural instincts and desires that are not consistent with God and not consistent with his word. And we know that instinctively because the law of God is written on our hearts, but we also know that from the word of God if we paid attention to it. There are things that we naturally will want to be pulled towards and want to do, want to act on that are contrary to God and his word, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. The eyes are the sort of window gate whereby all the temptations of the world, these philosophies, these ideologies, these temptations come into our mind. The lust of the eyes. And then, lastly, the pride of life. This would be arrogance in one's life or one's possessions. What one has accomplished or what one has. And all of these, my friends, come together to work against God's will and God's word. Moreover, they're coming against our ability to connect with God's people. So why does the world have to be overcome? And how is the world overcome? Well, for that second question, the world is overcome by faith. By faith in who? By faith in Christ. As we go back to the first point in this web, by faith in Christ, which opens our minds to who God is, opens our hearts to who God is, that enables us to do what? As we are in awe of God, we are able then to share in that with our brothers and sisters. We love the Father and all of his kids. Moreover, it fundamentally changes our experience with the Word of God, since we now want to come underneath the authority of the Word of God. And in this way, brothers and sisters, in this way, through faith, we overcome the world. We overcome the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. We're not perfect. Please hear this. We're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But in this way, we do overcome. It's ultimately the power of the gospel. One commentator puts it this way. Overcomers, via the new birth and faith in Christ, are no longer consumed, no longer consumed by what they don't have, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, or what they do have, pride in one's possessions. That spell has been broken. The shackles have come loose. The blinders have been removed. We no longer pine after and love stuff. Rather, with new holy affections, we pine after and love God. The new birth makes all of this possible, and faith 
gives us eyes to see it. This is how, my friends, we overcome. This is the victory, verses 4 and 5. This is the victory that we have in conquering the world, our faith. And isn't it true that this does enable us to overcome? When our eyes are on God, when our eyes are on Christ, amazed by his glory, amazed by his love, when our eyes towards fellow man is moved about by God's love, isn't this how we overcome? Well, Dustin, what do you mean? Well, when our eyes are not on God and not on his word, but rather are on stuff, or are fixated on our natural appetites that come into conflict with God and his word, what do we tend to do? We tend to resent God, right? We tend to begin to resent God, and we do essentially what Adam and Eve did in the garden. We go, God, you're holding out on us, aren't you? You're holding out on us. Like this whole book right here, that's inconvenient. Because I like to do what I like to do. I want to live how I want to live. And I, I think I'm pretty good at it. I think, I, I think I've got this world on a string, man. I've figured it out. Where's the conflict? Between your heart and God. But, but, when our eyes are on him, and we are amazed that he would adopt me into his family, that he would take away my sin and guilt and shame. I don't have to live underneath that anymore. I can have security and hope that if I were to die right now, I would go directly into his presence. What does that change? It changes everything. And it changes my perspective on this book. I'm like, I want to know what my father has to say. I want to live underneath the authority of what my father has to say. How does it change us horizontally, relationally? Well, if our eyes are fixated on our appetites and on stuff and on the next position, people tend to get in the way of that. Isn't that true? People and the necessary loyalty that we should have to people become very inconvenient, right? So I'm going to go through you to get what I want, right? Or if I don't like you, if, if you don't make me happy, I will discard you. Isn't that how a lot of people live? John says, this is not the way of Christ. This is not the way of Christ. Rather, if our eyes are on him, mesmerized by his love, what does he say? It changes everything this way as well. I want to live underneath the authority of the word of God, and I want to love my brothers. I want to love my brothers. And in this way, what happens? God's people overcome, my friends. God's people overcome these natural lusts, these natural appetites, and what God replaces those with is humility. Humility towards God, humility towards my brothers and sisters, humility towards my life, wanting to bring it underneath the authority of God's word. And there, my friends, please hear me as I close. There, my friends, you know security. There, my friends, you will know what it is to be secure in your relationship with God. Not because you've earned it, but because you are experiencing it, okay? You are experiencing the joy of being in Christ. This is the web, if you will, of security that John weaves through this letter. True faith in Christ, true belief in accuracy with regard to who Jesus was and is, true love for the Father and all of his kids, and a true life that comes underneath the authority of the word of God willingly, not perfectly, but eagerly and willingly. God is saying, my friends this morning, God is saying is if you are listening to this and your heart is resonating and you're going, that's me. Not perfectly, but that's me. I do love God. I am blown away that he would come after me. 
I have repented of my sins and I am trusting in Christ alone. And I do love my brothers and sisters. Sometimes I don't even understand it. But I just love them. I can't help it. I love them. We have this mutual experience of being blown away by God's grace. And somehow, God has changed my perspective to this book. I don't want to live my own way. I want to live underneath the authority of the word of God. What God is saying is, you're mine. I've got you. Isn't that great? God is saying, not in any kind of sinister way at all, I've got you. I've adopted you into my family. You can be secure. You can have assurance that you are mine. If you are hearing these things this morning and you're going, Dustin, it all sounds so good, but I don't know that I have that. I'm not sure that I understand about Christ to really say that I put my total faith, trust, belief in Christ alone. I'm not sure that I really love my brothers and sisters. I'm, I'm really not sure if I'm honest. I'm really not sure. And you know what? I have for a long time shirked lots of commands because they are inconvenient to how I want to live. Maybe what God is saying to you this morning is, come. It's an invitation. It's an invitation to know what it is to be secure. To actually have a relationship with God through Christ if you will repent of your sins and trust in Christ alone. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your grace. I pray that you would help us to continue to do a deep dive into your word and gospel, to be reminded anew and afresh, God, of your amazing grace to us your amazing grace that is found in Christ alone. Help us to be blown away. God, to the degree that we would just love each other and love your word. We thank you for the offer of security. You're so kind. In Jesus' name, amen.